Welcome to the D2 Reflection Solution. So let's get started on the first problem. If 30 is added to every number in a list, which of the following does not change? Well, adding 30 to every data point just shifts the data. <clears throat> that does mean that all measures of position will be affected, but not spread. And the only measure of spread is standard deviation, and that is unaffected. So again, you picture and taking all the data and shifting it together, that does not increase the spread. <laughs> okay, next one. Excuse me, I have allergies. Suppose each employee in a company receives a 10% raise for the next year. Each employee's salary is multiplied by 1.10. The standard deviation of the salaries for the employees will, well, Multiplying the data, if you're multiplying every data point by a constant, affects both position and spread. So the width will increase by 10%. So you can just say multiply by 1.10. Now, why don't we just multiply by 10%? Well, we said it's increased by 10%. And if I multiply by 10%, it'll actually get smaller. But if I multiply by 110% or 1.10, that will give me the new width. Number three, uh, a restaurant tracks the amount spent on meals. <coughs> it's approximately normally distributed with a mean of $24 and a standard deviation of $5.50. If an automatic 15% tip is added to the bill, what is the average and the standard deviation for a tip? So first of all, we're just multiplying one bill by really 1.15. Well, if you're calculating the tip, 0.15. <laughs> so sorry. Okay. So that means y equals 0.15x. So we're multiplying a data point or the data points, um, a data point by 0.15. So my expected value is going to increase by 0.15, right? And there you go. You take uh, 0.15 times 24, and your expected tip is $3. So we just, when we're just multiplying everything by a constant, all right, then we, we can multiply the expected value by a constant. So what happens is when you have a multiplier in here, it can just come, it, when you have a multiplier in here, it can just come out in front. And then the expected value of x is $24. I strongly recommend you watch the video notes if you're having trouble following along on this. So then we get an expected value of 360. Now variance, the way that behaves is the 0.15. Here, let me get my laser pointer so this is easy. There we go. The 0.15 here comes out, but it's squared. All right, because variance is standard deviation squared. Now, technically, I could have done this one a lot like I did the previous problem and said, oh, just multiply the standard deviation by 0.15, which is essentially what we have. If I took the, the 550 and multiplied it by 0.15, I would get $8.25. <clears throat> but let me talk you through the variance. So we pull this out squared, and variance is standard deviation squared, right? And then we multiply it all out, and then we have to take the square root to get to standard deviation. You're probably thinking, Mrs. Zoverman, that was such a hard way to do it when you said I could just multiply by 0.15. You are right. We're going to enter another problem where it's a different story, okay? Because here we're just taking one bill and multiplying by 0.15. We're not combining bills. We're just doing that. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Now, a server is attending to 10 tables. What is the expected total and standard deviation in the bills for all 10 tables combined? Well, I'm not going to multiply the 10 tables. <coughs> I'm sorry, the $24 by, well, I have to be careful with that. Um, I'm not just going to take 10 and multiply the standard deviation by that. It's not going to quite work. So this is not just multiplying one bill by 10. You've got 10 different bills. So you need to model that as an addition, like you have bill one plus bill two plus et cetera, et cetera, all right? So the expected value behaves well. Expected value for bill one, the sum of bill one through bill 10 
is the same as the expected value for bill 1 plus the expected value for bill 2 all the way up to bill 10. So that one does feel like you're just multiplying and you are. So the expected value behaves very nicely. Good news is when I usually ask these questions, I usually have expected value and standard deviation. The standard deviation, on the other hand, though, is a bit of a mess. So we're going to say, um, we can add variances when we have different outcomes. So variance of x1 all the way to variance of x10. And you're probably going, okay, well, that's times 10. You're right. It is times 10. So it's 10 times, since all the variances should be the same because it's for the variable, uh, and just pull out the 10. Okay. Well, but here's the thing. Um, the variance is standard deviation squared. So when I take that 5.5 squared, which is 30.25, and multiply it by 10, I get 302.5, right? Then I have to take the square root, and I get $17.39. If you had just multiplied 550 by 10, you would have thought the standard deviation was $55, but it's not. <laughs> Why is that? It's good. Well, it might be the case if we had all tables ordering exactly the same thing, so we could have a low bill on all tables or a high bill on all tables, and then I would get more extreme standard deviation. But actually what's gonna happen when you have 10 tables and you take the average of that, you're going to start getting tighter on your distribution, so your standard deviation is not going to be quite as high. Again, strong, if you're struggling with this, go through the notes, do the practice, and bug me. Okay, problems for 5-7. The high, average high temperature in Round Rock in October is 82 degrees Fahrenheit with a standard deviation of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the average temperature in Celsius? And here's the formula. Celsius equals Fahrenheit minus 32, and then you multiply by five nights. So a lot of you have a hard time with this question because uh, one, uh, well, to convert the expected value is not bad. So this part five should be easy. So let's do part five first. We just put in the expected value for Fahrenheit. All right, so I'm going to first pull out the five nights because I want to show you how the equation works. And then... <clears throat> expected value minus 32. So I can just plug in the expected value, <coughs> subtract, and then multiply, and I get 27.78c. So almost everyone should have gotten that one pretty straightforward, because it's like, oh, let me just plug in the expected value of 82, and then find out what my expected value in Celsius is. All right, now the standard deviation part. Well, I'm going to uh, do variance, okay, to show you how it's behaving. So, we have variance of C equals variance of the equation. I can pull out the 5 ninths and square it. Now, why did the 32 go away? Well, when you subtract the same number from every data point, you have not done anything to the width. So, we can ignore addition and subtraction, all right? And then when I take the square root, well, I'll multiply everything out first and then take the square root, and I get 5.55c. Now, if you take 5 ninths and multiply it by 10, you could have done the shortcut here. So why did the shortcut of just multiplying the 5 ninths work? Now, notice you're not going to subtract that 32, so don't do that. <laughs> well, the reason it worked is because we're just talking about uh, one measurement. We're not trying to combine like multiple months or maybe multiple years of October. We're just talking about the standard deviation of the temperature in general, okay? So I'm not trying to combine and create a new value for multiple measurements. This is one measurement. Okay, aha, uh -huh. like now, I decide to track the temperature over seven days and report the average and standard deviation. This is over seven separate days, not just seven times one day. So now if I took one day and I use that for everything, then yes, I could multiply by seven. But that's not what I'm doing. I'm taking seven separate days. So that means it's over multiple measurements. So when you go over multiple measurements, the behavior changes. Okay, so I have, I'm going to add all seven days and divide by seven. So that's my new average. And when I do that, 
expected value will behave very nicely. Um, expected value of x1 and x2 and x7, they're all the same expected value, so I can get 7 e to the x, so I just get the same value. So I would expect the average to be 82 de degrees. Yay, okay. Now the fun part, the standard deviation, and it's separate measurements. It's not one measurement. All right, so I model again my equation. I'm adding temperatures from seven days and then dividing by seven. So if I put this in the variance, I can pull out the one seven, but I gotta do a square on it, right? And then I have variance of x1 plus all the way to variance of x7. Well, I can add those, and hey, they should have the same variances, so I'm going to have 7 times the variance of x. Oh, these two 7s here, I can simplify it. It's just variance of x divided by 7. Then I take the square root, and I get 14.29. So you might have been tempted to say, oh, let me just take uh, 10 and... Uh, I don't know, multiply by 7 and then divide by 7, and then you get 10 again? That would be weird. No, you have to do this equation, this work, to get the right answer on these standard deviations. By the way, oh, I'm sorry, this is the variance, and I need to do the standard deviation, which is the square root. So, there you go. Number 8. Given these parallel box plots, which of the following is incorrect? The ranges are the same? Ah, oh, they're pretty similar. Interquartile ranges are the same. They look very similar. Both sets are skewed to both lower and higher values. Ah, skew is left or right, not both. It looks symmetric, but you can't see the actual shape of the block, box plot for part D. Um, and you can't compare an absolute number of data points with box plots. All right. Next one. And sorry, it's going to show the answer first. That's fine. Box A has four $10 bills and a single $100 bill. Box B has four $110 bills and a hundred $100 bills. And box C has 28 $1 bills. You can have all of box C or blindly pick one bill out of either box A or B. Which choice offers, offers the greatest expected winning? <coughs> so sorry. Okay. So. Expected value for box A, we have four of the bill, four out of five bills are ten dollars, and one out of five bills is a hundred dollars. So four fifths of ten is eight, one fifth of a hundred is twenty, we get twenty-eight dollars. Expected value for box B, okay, so we just have more bills. Oh, guess what? It turns out to be the same. And expected value for box C, they told you, oh, you get to keep all twenty-eight one dollar bills, so it's twenty-eight dollars. So the correct answer is E. They all offer the same expected weights. Which of the following is a true statement? Okay, so we got area under the standard normal curve, zero. Ah, oh, this looks familiar. Have we done this one before? And it's twice the area between zero and one. The area under the standard normal curve between zero and two is half the area between negative two and two. And for the standard normal cur curve, the interquartile range is approximately three. All right, it won't kill us to do this one again, so we'll go ahead and do it. So the area under the standard normal curve between zero and two is half the area between negative two and two. In fact, I'm certain we did this because I remember using Staplet to show you this. <sighs> um, A is false because if you calculate it on Staplet, 0.4772 um, is two times point. Oh, wait, let's see. Hold on. 0.4772 uh, would be the area from, from negative 2 to negative 2 is, is two times. Oh, let's see. Hold on. A is false. Let's see. Is twice, twice the area. Oh, yeah. So if you look here, this is saying this area is 0.4772. And this area is 0 0.3413. That makes sense. And so that doesn't work. Statement C, um, no, the interquartile range is actually, if you're doing a standard deviation base on Z, it's negative 0.67 to 0.67, which is basically twice 0.67. All right. And that's not three. Um, one out of 1,000 values are greater than those with a Z score of 10. Well, 
It's actually very small. It's 10 to the minus 20, so I don't know what number is that is big. I don't know my big numbers very well. I should learn them. So 10 to the, mi 10 to the tw minus 20, I should say, is a very small number. I was thinking of 10 to the 20, 1 over 10 to the 20. And then finally, the empirical rule applies to all normal distributions, which is why it's so beautiful. So our answer is B. All right, by symmetry, 0 to 2 is just half the area of negative 2 to 2. Problems 11 through 12, kids and toys. In, experiment, in an experiment on the behavior of young children, each subject is placed in an area with five toys. Past experiments have shown that the prob probability distribution and the number X of toys played with by a randomly selected subject is as appears in the given table. Which of the following expresses the event child plays with five toys in terms of X and gives the correct probability? <laughs> Well, the child is playing with exactly five toys, so I need x equals, all right? But then I can see x equals five is choice C, D, or E. And they have a question mark up there, so I need to go figure it out. So what I'm going to do is just add up all the other probabilities, figure out what I have, and then subtract that from one, there it is, and I get 0.11. So the probability the child plays with exactly five toys is 0.11. Almost through it. What is the probability that a randomly selected subject plays with at most three toys? So um, we had already figured out uh, 0.11, but we're not going to need it because we just need the probability that x is equal to three. So this is a good way to write it. Now you could make the x less than or equal look a little more like less than or equal, but there you go. Um, so we need to add up the probability when x is 0, 1, 2, and 3. It helps to realize that each of these outcomes up here count as at most three toys. They all fall into this category. So I substitute in the numbers, add them up, and get my value. Wow, those two were pretty easy. You're welcome. All right. 13, for which of the following would it be inappropriate to display the data with a single pie chart? Um, the distribution of shoe type worn by shoppers in a mall. So pie charts are great for categorical data, and that is categorical. That adds up to 100%, where people are not wearing more than one shoe, and it's one shoe type per person, so adds up to 100%. We're fine. Car colors for vehicles purchased in the last month. We're assuming each car would have only one color, one main color anyway, so it also adds up to 100%. Unemployment percentages for each of the 50 states. Well, uh, the good news is there's just one value for each state, but the problem is it's quantitative. It's not categorical data. We never use a pie chart for this. I mean, could you if you turned it into categorical data by like saying, oh, from here to here is a certain category, but not in this case. Each voter should, um, for the distribution of presidential candidate preferences, each voter would choose one candidate, so it adds up to 100%. And then finally, E, one sport per surveyed student, so it adds up to 100%. So our choice is C. Problems 14 and 15. A random sample of 1,200 U.S. college students were asked, was asked, what is your perception of your own body? Do you feel that you are overweight, underweight, or about right? The two-way table below summarizes data on perceived body image by gender. Suppose we randomly select one of the survey respondents. Number 14, given that the person perceived his or her body image as about right, what's the probability the person is female? So they said it's about right. So we don't look at any of the other numbers. We're given that we're in that category. All right. So I'll use my little... Um, I know I'm using the formula, but you're like, but those are probabilities. Well, they also work when you're just counting, by the way. So the probability of A given B equals probability of A and B all over the probability B. Okay, so I'm going to say 560 is female and about right. And the total of about right is 560 plus 295. And that works out to choice B. Last problem. Now we're switching it. Oh, not overweight given female, um, not overweight, underweight, aha, uh -huh. got to stop, I didn't do this problem right, uh, 
Okay, if the person selected is female, what's the probability that she did not perceive her body image as overweight? Good for her. Um, so we got to calculate the probability of not overweight given female. So first of all, we know they're female. So that's the data set we're looking at, right? And if I pull out my uh, formula, probability of not overweight given female is probability of not overweight and female over probability of female. Now, technically, again, I'm using counts, but that's fine because it's going to be out of that set of females. So it'll be okay. Um, so... 560 plus 37, those are the only, the 163 are the ones, here, let me get my laser pointer. The 163 are the ones that consider themselves overweight, but everyone else does not. So I have to add the 560 and the 37, and then divide by the total number of females, and we get 0.786, and there you go. So probably the only tricky part about that was the not overweight part, realizing you had to combine two categories.